Now, the European Space Agency has unveiled its space debris cleanup strategy. Since the 1960s, hundreds of thousands of debris have accumulated in orbit. Satellites, GPS systems and ex exploration vehicles. And the situation is not expected to improve in the coming years, hence the need to develop uh, de-orbiting solutions and make it binding for operators. This is the science segment, and we can bring in Julia Seeger. Great to see, see you, Julia. Uh, space debris has become a major concern for the sustainability of uh, space activities. That's right, and that's why uh, ESA has, uh, and France actually, is trying to uh, introduce this zero debris charter by 2030. France and ESA are actually at the forefront of this issue with France that uh, enacted a law on space operations that imposes a responsible uh, approach to end-of-life procedures for satellites as early as 2008. Now, they want to go further. They want to make the initiative binding uh, for operators indeed, because despite all of the efforts that were made by companies in the sector, well, we we live in a tech era and hence uh, space pollution is indeed growing. And what is the extent of the problem? So you may have seen, Delano, this picture where you see this representation of Earth uh, kind of surrounded in this cloud of objects where uh, you see it here. It's actually a, a good a good picture to try to raise awareness about the issue, but it's actually quite misleading because space is, uh, you know, infinitely larger and much, much emptier than we may think. So there are more uh, objects than what you're seeing here on the picture, but they're further away from each other. But what you're seeing, every uh, dot that you're seeing represents uh, an object that is larger than 10 centimeters. There are about 36,000 of them, mm -hmm. uh, including 8,000 active satellites. And then you have millions of uh, small little pieces of debris as well. So you have about 150 million objects that are larger than uh, uh, one millimeters and a million objects that are uh, larger than one centimeters. It's absolutely humongous. And uh, which orbit does this affect? So it affects what we call geostationary orbits. So that's 20 to 36,000 kilometers. This is where you'll find a, a larger communication satellites. And the reason why is because 25 years ago, the international community decided that it could be a good idea to send end-of-life satellites on these uh, graveyard orbits to avoid collisions. Mm. Uh, now, it does affect also lower Earth orbits. So this is much closer to us. It's seven, uh, 700 kilometers to 1,100 kilometers. And this is actually a huge problem because this entire area area is absolutely completely congested today. Because think about it, in the 60s and 70s, you had the surge of uh, space exploration. Then you had uh, the development of cell phones in the 90s. And now you have these mini satellite constellations uh, that are being deployed to bring internet to the most remote areas. So among the debris, you'll find, of course, these uh, uh, small satellites. You'll find debris from uh, spacecrafts as well. Um, so you really find lots uh, of different, uh, you know, lots of different objects, but you have to track all of them because they have a, a very important velocity up there in space. So even the smallest little debris can come and hit, for instance, the, the International Sp uh, Space Station. So mm -hmm. we actually have a picture of this very, very small debris that hit uh, the International Space Station in 2021. And it's absolutely incredible how much uh, they have to really track every single piece. Okay, we, we'll get we'll, that. We'll get to that we, picture. We'll get, hopefully we'll get the picture. <laughs> Are operators required to dispose of this end-of-life oh, spacecraft? Well, it, it is a really good question. Actually, uh, theoretically, they're supposed to deorbit their aircrafts after 25 years, but this is only a guideline. It's not binding, and it doesn't account for the risk of malfunction. Uh, now, most retired satellites can now be maneuvered back on Earth, and uh, when they do so, upon reentry to the atmosphere, they tend to burn up and disintegrate, but if they don't, they're actually brought to a, a spot here called the Nemo spot. It's in the Pacific Ocean, and they're literally crashed there. So this is a graveyard for spacecrafts. There are about 260 of them already, and this is actually where the International Space Station will be crashed within a few uh, years. Now, you also have accidents that can happen, unfortunately, and you have some debris that can actually fall back on Earth. We're actually going to see a picture uh, of one of them as well, uh, a space debris that can just fall, as you can see here, we're uh, in Spain with a piece of debris, actually, from, uh, I think this was from uh, from ESA, actually. And do we have a lot of debris that falls back to work, or does it stay in? Well, actually, we have about one piece of debris per day 
that falls back on Earth. But statistic statistically speaking, because men only live on a very small portion of the Earth, it tends to end up in the ocean. ocean. Uh, so, but it does uh, indeed uh, fall back on Earth quite a bit. Uh, there are many solutions that are trying to be deployed to to face this problem. You have these satellites with articulated uh, robotic arms, but also with these uh, magnetic docking uh, mechanism to try to retrieve the satellites. But nothing is really at scale compared to the extent of the problem. Uh, and also, Julia, making headlines today, a team of uh, international scientists uh, has detected a new carbon compound in science, something they've been looking for since, what, the 1970s? Absolutely. It's been 50 years. And I want to talk about this because, yes, we do have a dumpster uh, uh, above our heads, but we also have this treasure trove of wonders. We're going to see this picture. It was taken uh, by the... Uh, the uh, James Webb satellite, and uh, they were able to find for the first time what we call methyl cation. This is actually a foundation of all known life, uh, and we've been looking for it for, for decades. We, it was discovered in the Orion Nebula that you can see here. It's located at 1,350 uh, light years away. It's absolutely uh, amazing. It's going to help us understand a little bit more about the origins of life, but also if life will be able to develop elsewhere in the universe. Thank you very much for that, Julia. Julia Seeger there with uh, 